Spinosaurs, in particular the genus Spinosaurus, after which the group is named, continue to be a family of much mystery and intrigue, and as was seen with the description of the former's large and paddle-like tail back in 2020, there is still much to learn about them. What followed from this description was a swath of discussion and heated debate on just how effective this tail would have allowed them to be as either a pursuit or ambush predator, and whether or not Spinosaurus as a whole was more of a terrestrial wazer, only entering the water when necessary, or being an effective swimmer, being continually talked about. A more recent description made earlier in 2022 has turned up and clarified information and data on not just Spinosaurus, but also the close relatives like Suchomimus and Baryonyx, which alongside other animals has revealed a lot about them, and there are quite a few surprises to be had. Secondary, aquatic adaptations have independently evolved more than 30 times from terrestrial vertebrate ancestors, and for decades, it was assumed that based on fossil evidence that non-avian dinosaurs were an exception to this pattern. This dismissive view based on the absence of evidence, however, was really stating the evidence of absence, and a few taxa have been hypothesised as being partly or predominantly aquatic, the most well-known examples being a range of spinosaurs and the peculiar house character, although the latter is more controversial. Said controversies remain, and have remained ambiguous, largely due to the difficulty of reliably identifying unambiguous anatomical adaptations for aquatic habits, especially in these extinct animals. In the study that I'll be talking about, conducted by Matteo Fabri and colleagues, set out to demonstrate some form of relationship between some factor that ties in with aquatic ecologies across extant amniotes to provide reliable inference of aquatic habits in extinct species, with the main focus being on the enigmatic Spinosaurids, which if you've seen videos either on my channel or on others similar to mine, you'll know just how strange they are. The idea for the study came about partially after a museum visit, with Fabri remembering going around the zoological exhibition of the Museum La Spicola in Florence, and noticing a mounted skeleton of a hippo. He stated that in person he was, quote, shocked to see how an animal that we are used to seeing in aquatic environments doesn't have striking skeletal traits suggesting such ecology, end quote which got him wondering as to whether non-avian dinosaurs, in particular Spinosaurus and other Spinosaurids, had other, more well-hidden, aquatic traits too. Spinosaurus has an odd collection of features, including their iconic sail, short and muscular legs, nostrils set well back from their snouts, as well as long teeth, which suggests to those involved in the study and elsewhere that they would have been capable swimmers. In particular, they had very dense leg bones, a key feature of many known aquatic animals that helps in ballast to remain submerged for extensive periods, alongside buoyancy control, which was the proxy of nose that could be assessed. Bone density across the animal kingdom is a general tell in terms of whether an animal is able to sink beneath the surface of the water to swim through this enhanced buoyancy control, and to best assess the relationship between bone density and the ability to submerge, the team compiled a great menagerie of animals to find a link between this and aquatic foraging behaviour. The adaptation to aquatic habitats constitutes a major evolutionary transition, often culminating in a fundamental and very noticeable transformation of the ancestral body plan, although this isn't always the case. Many aquatic taxa possess few, if any, readily visible anatomical indicators of a water-related ecology, and instead share numerous traits with terrestrial animals, key examples being hippos, as mentioned, as well as some of the earliest cetaceans. It is therefore plausible that some dinosaurs then, currently considered to have been fully terrestrial on the basis of anatomical proxies and phylogenetic bracketing, might instead represent the early stages of an evolutionary trajectory and transition towards more aquatic environments. Osteosclerosis, which is characterised by the hardening of bone and its resulting density, as mentioned, occurs widely as an adaptation to aquatic life in extant amniotes, with it involving the additional deposition of bone mass, leading to the presence of a thick bone cortex which infills the medullary cavity, the hollow part of the bone which contains the marrow. Although previously used for paleoecological inference, Bone density has generally been used on single clade specific studies, and in order to more broadly assess a correlation between this and an aquatic lifestyle, more comparisons with a phylogenetically broad datasets would need to be made to find a more clear correlation for the study to proceed. Fabri and his colleagues put together a dataset consisting of femur and rib bone cross sections from 380 total observations representing 206 and 174 extant and extinct amniotes respectively, with 84 overlapping taxa occurring between the two datasets. It includes mammals, modern reptiles and birds, alongside 39 non-avian dinosaurs and 7 Mesozoic stem birds to test for correlations between density and ecology. 
the scope of the study continued to expand, according to Dr. Ibrahim, one of the key researchers involved in our current understanding of Spinosaurus and its anatomy, as the team continued to think of more and more groups of vertebrates to include, with animals as mentioned being collaborated together across both a range of clades and sizes, not to mention niches. This large sample size, in fact, is one of the largest and most phylogenetically comprehensive ever assembled up until the study's published results, meaning that any such trends relating to bone density and the niches in animal fields should be somewhat evident, considering. To properly visualise the differences in density, terrestrial and flying amniotes have as mentioned earlier a large medullary cavity, which leads in turn to a lighter skeleton, and appear more ring-like in cross-section when compared to the nearly completely solid ones of more reliably aquatic animals. The analysis of the data confirms that there was indeed a correlation, and was therefore an excellent indicator in assessing aquatic tendencies and habits. While there may be some more controversial elements which will be discussed later, the data presents a clear picture in regards to Spinosaurs, and even with them there are some surprises, and that their behaviour was even more diverse than originally thought. Subaqueous foraging, where animals feed underwater for prolonged periods, as clarified in the study, was evidently found to be the case in Spinosaurus, clustering closely to adept swimmers like the Protocetus myocetus, a basal cetacean, which has been inferred to have been somewhat amphibious. A big surprise resulting from this clustering was that Baryonyx, that's while appearing more terrestrial inclines due to its different anatomy, also plotted closely, and alongside Spinosaurus as a subaqueous forager, having the highest values of any of the other dinosaurs in the study being similar in bone density to elephants and hippos, and being higher than any extant taxa that otherwise do not undergo habitual submersion in water like these aforementioned mammals do. This high bone density is present not just in the femora and dorsal ribs, but also extends to the rest of their limbs, alongside axial pneumatization in their cervicals, increasing their density even further. This association of diving habits in these animals, while indeed well supported beforehand, and even more so after the study, still has some contention surrounding it and the extent to what they were doing in the water. Ibrahim and his team have previously suggested that Spinosaurus would have been more so of an aquatic pursuit predator, although others like Thomas Holtz and David Hone have suggested that because of the orientation and anatomy of their skulls, alongside the morphology of their necks, that they were more suited with wazing and vertical striking like herons, rather than catching prey underwater. As it currently stands, a more ambush-centred approach to hunting is more likely given the available data, and fits in better when evaluating Spinosaurus's anatomy, especially considering that there is another animal to consider that does appear to follow more of a wading lifestyle. Recovers with a non-diving ecology, Suchomimus, one of the largest and most well-known Spinosaurids, alongside Spinosaurus and Baryonyx, while appearing to more closely match the anatomy of Baryonyx, was very different, ecologically speaking, with them having more hollow bones, more comparable to other large theropods like Tyrannosaurus, than its closest relatives, revealing that Spinosaurs were more ecologically disparate than previously thought. Suchomimus appears therefore to have been more terrestrially oriented, and as mentioned, would likely have filled in more of a wading niche near the water's edge, rather than diving for food like their relatives. Something which is further interesting, and also something which will surely lead to more discussion, is that from a phylogenetic optimization of bone density and the presence of osteosclerosis across the group, tentatively suggests that subaqueous foraging is actually ancestral for Spinosauridae, and that the absence of extensive osteosclerosis in Suchomimus resulted from secondary loss rather than primitive absence, meaning Suchomimus secondarily evolved to have less dense bones from a more basal, aquatic ancestor. It is possible that environmental factors, such as a sparser distribution of aquatic settings, e.g. rivers and lakes, led to less specialised foraging in this genus, although more regarding their habitats and likewise for other Spinosaurs, will be important to determine more of their evolutionary trajectories and outcomes. As mentioned, the study also brought up a range of other animals, with another notable revelation coming from the Dromaeosaurids Halscoraptor, which has been consistently proposed as a remarkable example of an aquatic Dromaeosaurid representative, although there is a good amount of scrutiny behind this claim, resulting in vigorous debate. This paper brings up another piece of data to this discussion, showing that Halscoraptor does not have particularly dense femoral bones, something which would suggest that they were not as capable swimmers and or divers as has been suggested, and therefore have a weak or absent probability of being subaqueous foragers. Comparisons to other swimming animals reveals that the density is fairly similar when compared to ducks and anhingas, which are of course known for being aquatic waders and foragers, with wading birds that feed in water but rarely submerge, like herons, pelicans and gulls, all having a similar compactness to non-aquatic taxa. This means that infrequent subaqueous foraging and wading behaviour 
is not significantly associated with variation in bone density, meaning that it doesn't necessarily contradict the idea that host crabs are, may have foraged aquatically, just that they didn't regularly dive beneath the surface. Another analysis done by Nathan Mervold found issue with the initial study's conclusions, suggesting that selective bone sampling, faulty inferences, and the redefinition of the term aquatic being notable criticisms, although much of this was disregarded by the authors of the initial study. Dr. Jingmai O'Connor, one of the co-authors of the study, stated that collaborative studies like this one that draw from hundreds of specimens are the future of paleontology, and that's while being time-consuming to do, they allow scientists to best able shed light onto big patterns, rather than making qualitative observations based on one fossil at a time. The paper concludes by stating that we are currently underestimating the ecological diversity throughout the fossil record, and that a lot can be understood about a range of taxa and their habits from even the most fragmentary and sparse fossils. Spinosaurs as a whole are clearly even more unusual and varied than we already understood them to be, as they were up until this paper's release, and there is sure to be more yet to be understood and described about them if we know where to look and why. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you would like to see more from this channel, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already. And with that, I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.